Well, hello and welcome to the June 9th, 2024 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. It's why we call ourselves Hammond's Bible Church. Our contact information is at the end of this video. Use it to call us, email us, check out our World Wide Web. A lot of information and that, again, that information is at the end of this video and would love to hear from people who are new to our ministry. July is rapidly approaching and July 15th through the 19th is our soccer camp outreach. And we're just asking that you be praying for the impact of this camp, impact with the children, with their families, hoping that we'd have over 100 children attend. We usually have about 125, 150 sign up, but I'm hoping that actually 100 actually attend. I think last year we had several nights when we were over 90, but like to push it to 100 this year. So thank you for praying ahead of time. And now as we are going to continue our study of the book of 1 John, have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 2. We'll be there right after we transition in and out of our music ministry. Thank you. 
In this video, we are going to continue to talk about that which is genuine, specifically how to be assured that something is genuine. And the reason we are talking about assurance of that which is genuine is because we're applying this to the doctrine of assurance of salvation. It is one of the most important doctrines that is in the New Testament. It is something that we believe at Christian Fellowship Church is explicitly taught. Many false churches do not teach this doctrine. Many churches that are off theologically will not teach this doctrine. <clears throat> I believe it's very important that we understand why false teachers will not teach us, and that is because false teachers do not want you to ever leave them. If you leave them, you leave their church, then they always hold over you the thought that you will lose your salvation. And it's a control factor. But I can tell you, if you come to Christian Fellowship Church and you learn about salvation and you become born again and you decide for whatever reason that you're no longer going to attend our church, doesn't mean you lose your salvation. And that is, I think, reprehensible that somebody would teach that for that purpose. So as we've been talking about this subject, as we're working through the book of 1 John, I hope that this is something that you are contemplating because the book of 1 John has one of its benefits that you know for certain that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. So I hope you've been thinking about this concept of how to be assured of that which is genuine. And last week, I started off with the illustration of several things, like if you were making an investment, nobody would ever want to invest in fool's gold because you would trade your hard-earned cash for gold, and in actuality, that gold isn't genuine. So you want to be assured that you're purchasing um, real gold, not fool's gold. You would never want to purchase a house, maybe put a large down payment on a home, and all of a sudden, after you uh, get the title, find out that the title was not a genuine title so that you would lose your down payment or maybe you lose several years of mortgage payments because you have found out that somebody else now is taking over your home because you never really owned it. That would be horrible. And obviously you would never want to be involved in a relationship, be in a marriage, be in a friendship with someone that is a fake friend, not genuine. And you need to be able to assure yourself that you're investing in this relationship with someone that is genuinely um, committed to you, someone that's in love with you. So knowing that which is genuine is very, very important. And in studying this subject and thinking about this subject, one of the things that you uh, would find a, um, uh, a, a big mistake is that if you threw away that which is genuine or you sold that which is genuine, for almost nothing or you gave it away so i was starting to think about you know where people go and they do garage sales they, go, they do estate sales and they find these deals and we all love to go to a garage sale we all love to find something that you know somebody is selling for or a very inexpensive amount sometimes a dollar sometimes five dollars ten dollars and that it could mean a lot to us like i know when my wife holds garage sales she'll sell <laughs> <laughs> like an old lawnmower and so I said I can take that I'll take it for 20 bucks and I'll get it going and I'll get it working I'll make it efficient and for them it's worth worth a lot well I also know that there have been garage sales yard sales that have resulted in people um, selling things that are worth millions uh, I went through a website that actually tracks this and there are several websites that do this but there are like 40 garage sales. The top 40 are listed. Let me work through the top three, starting with the number three um, greatest purchase ever at a garage sale. And it happened several years ago where a man bought an Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol is a famous um, artist. They bought a, a sketch. They thought it was totally inexpensive. The guy buys it for $5 and finds out that it is worth two million dollars. We all love that. And then there was in California a yard sale where a person bought a bowl for three dollars. Well, wait, maybe it might not be California. It might have been England. So <laughs> it might be off on that one. But it's a he bought this bowl for three dollars. Comes to find out it was from China. And it was um, from the very famous Northern Song Dynasty. This bowl was 
worth $2.2 million he, he sold it for. And then the all-time greatest purchase at a yard sale um, was where a man went in and he bought a box of glass negatives for $45. So paid a little bit more, but in the end, it was worth it because the glass negatives were from the famous photographer Ansel Adams, and he, um, the, the, the person who bought this was able to find out that the negatives he bought for $45 were worth over $200 million. Now, we would all love to find something like that where it was worth a lot, and part of my dilemma is when you find something like that, do you have the obligation to go back and um, tell, morally at least, hey, do you know what you really sold me here? You know, you sold it for five, it's worth two million. <clears throat> I know for myself that I feel bad for people who do this, and I know when I was younger, we had a, a tough time financially. My mother was having a, a garage sale, and during the garage sale, some lady finally came to my mother and said, do you know what you're selling here? My mother had these uh, depression glass, uh, this depression glass set that she had got from my grandmother, and my mother was selling it for pennies on the dollar, and it was worth several hundred dollars. And obviously, once the lady had the honesty to say, do you know what you're selling here? My mother changed direction on how she was selling it. But you can understand, you know, where someone says, well, this is a great purchase. Well, what about the people that are selling it and how uh, it impacts them? I know my own wife had gone to a, an estate sale and she was going to buy a purse. It was a really great purse. But in examining it, Becky found out, my wife found out that there was so about six, seven hundred dollars in this purse. And she graciously went to the sellers and said, do you know what you're selling here? This is, you know, cash. And they would never have known. And they were so, so thankful for, for Becky coming forward and telling them. Now, what the reason I'm talking about this, you say, there's some great devastation. If you were struggling for money and you sold something, even though it was worth ten thousand dollars. The reason I'm talking about this is because when we're dealing with assurance of salvation, if you don't think you're saved, you're going to give away your life. You're going to give away the opportunity that you have to live as a faithful believer. And it's critical that we remember our salvation is priceless. You can't put a price on it. Last week I shared Mark 8.36 and it says, What does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Well, in the sermon that I actually preached, I use an illustration, and I use it here now, is if you had a, a, a painting worth a billion dollars and you had a certificate that represented your salvation, you would never say, well, I'll give you my certificate of salvation for that billion dollar painting. You wouldn't take, give that certificate for all the wealth in the world because all the wealth in the world is not worth your priceless soul. Your priceless soul goes on forever. The, world's wealth, whatever it is, is going to pass away. The world is going to, one day, you know, everything's going to burn up. Nobody would ever make that exchange. Well, even worse, you know, if you had your salvation and you didn't treat it as if it's valuable. How does that go on? Because you, you don't think that you're saved. You don't think it's worth to read your Bible. You don't think it's worth to serve or to give or to witness. Well, if that's where you're at, you are, in essence, throwing away your life. Remember, 1 John 5.13 says these things have been written in order that you may know you have eternal life. God wants you to have it. And the book of 1 John is working through all kinds of ways to give you assurance. So if you're in 1 John, look at verses 3 to 6. And this is one of the clearest tests that are in all the Bible, and especially 1 John. John writes in verse 3, By this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says in verse 4, I've come to know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So these are two tests, two ways, two procedures for you to get assurance of salvation. Now when we come to these two tests, there are two key words that we need to emphasize. And I talked about them last week, the word know and the word keep. The word know comes from one of several Greek words on knowledge. And this is the Greek word gnosko. It means knowledge from experience. And we all 
through the way we live can gain experience that we have the information that we are truly born again. Sadly, some people will say, boy, you think you know you're a believer? How arrogant are you? You think you know God? How arrogant, how self-righteous? Well, no, look at verse three. By this we know, he repeats it twice. This is the word that conveys information through a relationship. It's used in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 10. And I encourage you, if you haven't done it already, because I mentioned it last week, go back and look at those verses as the Apostle Paul in Philippians talks about his salvation and the experience of knowing Jesus Christ. So I always use this as a way to express the information that's being conveyed. It's the type of information that, you know, as I know my wife, I know my children, I have this close relationship with them and I have experiences with them. I have knowledge of them. I can tell you, I know my wife, I know my children. In comparison, I know that President Biden is the president of the United States, but I don't have a relationship with him. I can tell you facts about him, uh, you know, being a U.S. Senator, being, you know, that his wife's a doctor and things like that. But from the perspective of, of intimacy and knowledge, I don't have that with him. But I have it with my wife, I have it with my children, and according to Philippians 3, I have it with Christ. And I think that is no accident that that Greek word is being conveyed. The second Greek word there is the word keep. And it comes from a Greek word that talks about something where you are focusing on that which is internal as well as your external. And I think that's the genius when you look at verse 3 when it says if we keep his commandments, that John doesn't say if we obey his commandments. And we talked a little bit about this last week. The commandments are, are the New Testament commandments like husbands love your wives and, and you know, the character traits in, in a, like Ephesians 4 about not stealing and not being, um, <coughs> not being a liar, things like that. So we're not talking about the Old Testament law about not eating shrimp or not wearing clothes with two different fabrics. And those are not what's applicable here. What we're talking about is, is keeping the commandments. But like I said, keeping the commandments that are in the New Testament, but he didn't say obey. Now I'll talk about obedience tests in the book of 1 John, but I want you to understand if the complete picture of using the word keep is broader than that because it deals with that which is internal that it's something that it's of great concern for you. That's why we've used the expression, or excuse me, the verse in Psalm 119 that talks about, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. As the psalmist in Psalm 119 talks about, God's word is valuable to them. And the idea of keep is that it's like you're treasuring it. That is then put into practice externally when you actually do the commandments. So these two words are played out through 1 John 2, 3 to 6. You see them repeated and repeated. Keep and know. Know and keep. So the idea here is that we can be blessed. Look at 1 John is that the, the, overall, the overall blessing is we know that we've come to know him. So it's not arrogant. And we have that assurance. We have the doctrine of assurance, which we call the helmet of salvation from Ephesians 6. The idea that we have this protection on our head, because if we don't, then we decide that, that okay, I don't think I'm a believer. So I'm not going to witness. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to serve. I'm basically throwing away my life, I'm throwing away a life that if I'm not living the Christian life, then I'm not going to be getting the reward that 1 Corinthians 3 talks about. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that believers live for reward because God has emphasized it over and over and over. You know, it's like, look, if, you know, it's like when a company says, hey, you, you, um, if, you know, let's say it's a company like a coffee shop that you always go to and they say, well, if you sign up for our member membership club, you get all these rewards. Well, you say, no, nah, it's not for me. Well, it's costing you because if you are regularly partaking of that company and that company is always giving you rewards for being a regular member then you could save yourself sometimes hundreds of dollars i know that there's gas stations that do the same thing and look if you're already doing it take advantage of it so if you're already a believer 
take advantage of what God has said. So the blessing is, is that we can have this salvation, a helmet of salvation. And as I emphasized last week, you get a head wound, it is devastating. And the head wound in salvation is that you don't think that you're a believer. God wants you to not think that this is arrogant. So he gives the standard, and the standard was in verse 3, if we keep his commandments. So the idea is internally and externally, I value them and then I put them into practice. And when that happens, what happens is I have knowledge that I'm born again. But the first example he gave us was negative, because look at verse 4. The one who says, makes this claim, I've come to know him. And the idea is it's something I did in the past. I made a profession 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And I've come to know him, but doesn't keep his commandments. So I'm not regularly valuing, I'm not regularly treasuring God's commandments. They're a liar. And, you know, we live in a world that doesn't want to call people liars. They don't want to say there's absolute truth. But there is absolute truth. And what, what is the lie? The lie is that you are a believer. So this is where you have to say, how am I really looking at God's word? Am I keeping his commandments? Am I someone who values God's commandments? If you're not reading God's word on a regular basis, if you're not putting into practice God's word on a regular basis, absolutely, that is a great concern. And that is why you need to look at your life honestly when you go through these. And you can't just have somebody else take the test. A parent shouldn't necessarily look at this for their children. And a spouse cannot, shouldn't necessarily look at this for someone else. Um, their other for, for, should, should look at their spouse that way. Ultimately, every individual has to make their honest assessment because where is this ultimately starting? It starts in the heart. Do you treasure God's commandments? Okay, but if you don't, if that's why you don't read God's word, if you're, this is why you don't worry about implementing God's word, then you've got a problem because your claim is a lie. Lie about being a believer. And the one that ultimately gets hurt is you because your, your soul isn't worth anything now. I mean, you've forf you've lived, you're living for the world. You're not truly born again. And so look at what verse 4 says, the truth, the, the, the reality of what, what you're claiming isn't in you. You're not truly born again. You're not a believer. Well, as we come to verse 5, now we see the positive example. It says, but whoever keeps his word. So it's open-ended. It could be anybody. It could be the pastor. It could be the pastor's wife. It could be the children. It could be someone, that, an elder, um, his children. This, this is not just for the elite. It, that some people perceive and that's in a church. And I'm not saying anyone that in a church is a leader or anything like that, but I'm just saying, listen, this is open for anybody. So you don't look just like, oh, John MacArthur and his family get to know whether they're born again, or you know, this pastor or that pastor, or this, this individual, this author, this professor. No, this is open for anybody, whoever. So if you're somebody that regularly keeps God's word, another way for talking about the Bible, then you are somebody that the love of God has been perfected. And now the love could be love towards God or God's um, love towards us. I believe it's God's love for us because I think he's the one who initiates salvation. And, and what he's talking about is, is the idea of, I believe God's work in us being completed, being perfected. <coughs> so, excuse me. So when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, and you place your faith in the gospel, and remember the gospel deals with man's sin. But Jesus is God and man who died to pay the penalty for sin, rose again to prove the payment was received by God the Father. And fifth, by faith alone, we appropriate it to our lives. As God is working in us, his work is complete. And when it's complete, we're born again, we become children of God, God's seed is in us. All these expressions that are used in the New Testament that you know, we wish that we could take an x-ray and we could say, oh my goodness, I see the seal of salvation. I see, I see completely healed you know, um, x-ray that indicates that their soul is perfect. I don't know if any of you ever had like a chest x-ray or dealt with someone that was going through maybe some cancer treatment or something and they take an x-ray. And I can remember I sat with someone who was dealing with a lot of cancer and they took an x-ray and, and 
boom, the x-ray was filled with what the doctor said are these, the, the cancer, you can see it everywhere. Well, wouldn't it be great, you know, if you could look at your x-ray and you see your soul and you say, oh my goodness, prior to being saved, I had sin all through my soul. Now I have a new soul. That's why I'm a saint. I'm holy. I, I have a spiritual x-ray and it's completely clean. Well, that is what we're saying. It, it, the clean soul wants to honor God's word, wants to keep God's word. And the love of God has been perfected. Now, I said that ultimately the person that is looking at, that, at this as a test should be able to, should not be able to necessarily always tell where another person is, but it, because the ultimate standard is what someone internally wants. But the re, there is a reality that I could say to somebody, listen, I just don't see the attitude in you. And if somebody tells you that, they're hopefully being honest and they're very, being very caring so that, yeah, it should be a red flag. So, but the positive here is that if you are keeping his word, God's love has truly been perfected in you. And that's what we want. We want you to have the helmet of salvation. God wants you to know that you're saved. So there you go. That was the very first test. I call it the keeping of God's commands test. Again, not just talking about obedience because this is more than obedience. Well, John isn't finished yet. He has a second test. And he talks about the fact that we have to walk like Jesus. Because look what he says. At the end of verse 5, he says, By this we know that we are in him. In him, I believe that's in Jesus, and that we have a relationship with him. By this we know, again, the concept of gnosko, the idea of the fact that we have the ongoing present awareness that we have a relationship with him. So, you know, if you said, do you have a relationship with President Biden? I can honestly tell you no. But if I, if I went around and I said, you know what, I know President Biden, I know the president, I, and, and, and you know, you'd say, well, how do you know him? Well, <laughs> um, can you call him up? Can you go visit him? The answer would be no. Well, the reality of it is, is I don't have that kind of knowledge, right, with the president, but I know that I have a relationship with Jesus. And here is the second type of test. It's called the walking like Jesus. And this is because he is my Lord, he's my Savior, and he is influencing me. So he, the one who says that, he says, by this we know that we are in him, that we have this relationship. The one who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. And he, the idea is emphasizing a person's walk. Now, you know, there's secular songs like Walk This Way, and, and there's, there's secular information like, you can tell a lot of person about how they, they live, how they walk. We use that expression. We're going to do a, a little review on this in a second. But the idea of walk is the pattern of your life. And when you have a claim that you're a believer, you should walk like Jesus. And several years ago, these bracelets made a big deal in the Christian world. The WW, um, you know, bracelets, what would Jesus do, WWJD bracelets, and the concept was all around. And it is a fair concept. What would Jesus do in a situation? Because you, when you read the New Testament Bible, it's influencing you to think like Jesus, because the, the New Testament word is the word of Christ. And as Colossians says, let it dwell richly in you. So this is a way of knowing that your claim is genuine. And so the blessing that you know is that you know that you are in Christ, that you have a relationship with him. And so the, the idea is you ought to walk in the same manner. The one who makes the claim of abiding in him. And I, the word abiding is a New Testament word that is very important to understand. It's like the realm in which you live. And you know, we live in Chicago area, and so when it's winter time, we have the weather influence us. Whether it's cold weather, snow weather, sleet weather, it influences us. And then, you know, the idea of, of you know, whether we're dealing with allergy season, <coughs> which I sometimes still deal with in this area, the idea is 
the realm in which we live and the, it, the, the type of politics, the type of rules and regulations that we live in. Um, you know, we live sometimes struggling. Sometimes we don't like all the rules that government puts in us. But when I recently had the opportunity to go and visit Cairo, Egypt, I was really taken back on the street rules that there were no lanes that were that were that were specifically light out. There were no street lights. You, it was just first come first serve or push yourself through it. it. It would have been very difficult for me to actually be driving a vehicle in Egypt under that kind of arena because I live in a world. As much as I sometimes don't like all the government laws <laughs> that come down, I love the fact that there are street lights that people obey them people see stop signs and they stop now obviously there are times people get ticketed and stuff like that but just take that as an example where i abide it influences the way i drive it influences the way i shop it influences the way i dress all of that comes into play there's a reason this word was used here because the realm in which i live now as a christian is under the influence of jesus the one who says he abides in him so Jesus is influencing me. And, and if I say that I live in a realm and a relationship with Jesus, he ought, I ought to work, to walk in the same manner. The idea of ought is it's the obligation. It's the necessity. It's, you know, you know it, it's something that is like required. It should go hand in hand. So if someone says I'm a believer, but they could care less about God's commandments. No, you ought to walk in the same manner. You ought to have that <laughs> mentally, at least. What would Jesus do bracelet? You ought to be thinking about, <coughs> about how you're living your life. So the person that says, I, 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 I love Jesus, I'm a believer, but they're not reading God's word, they're not putting God's word into practice, and then they're not living like Jesus, that's a problem, people. And, and you say, well, what are you talking about, walk? Well, turn your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, and Ephesians chapter 4 is a book that really emphasizes not only the position of every believer, but the practice of every believer. And when you come to the book of Ephesians and you come to chapter 4, there is this ongoing influence that we, we recognize the importance of how we walk, how we live. And if you would go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, you see that if you're going to do a study on walk, this is perhaps the best two chapters, Ephesians 4, Ephesians chapter 5, that emphasize walk. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore I, who, the Apostle Paul, prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. Walk worthy. Walk differently than the world. You jump down to verse 17, and he says, I say this and affirm with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. So this is what is asked of you. If you jump down to um, chapter 5, and it talks about the fact that um, we are to be people that, let me see, um, I missed one. I walk. We are to be people that um, walk as children of the light. Verse eight, chapter five. So it says, "For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light." Um, verse fifteen. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And I think a missing one in there. Um, yeah, the idea is is that we are people who live differently. So you study chapters four and five, and you recognize that how we live our lives does matter. And so I encourage you, walk like Jesus does. Walk to the level of expectation. And a person who's, who says, well, you know, I'm not always perfect, right? We've already been told in 1 John chapter 1, if you go turn back to 1 John chapter um, one verse nine if we mess up we confess our sins but this idea of 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 living like jesus is not too much to implore upon you to put upon you this isn't required to earn salvation 
But it, for the person that's been born again, the person who has got seed in them, the person who has got spirit in them, the person who you take that spiritual x-ray, if you could, that now has a new soul, is somebody that wants to live like Jesus and doesn't want to live in the impurity of the Gentile way, the unsaved way. So what God wants you to do, remember, he's writing this so that you know you have eternal life. And the, the idea is that once you know it, you're going to live differently. God wants you to know. So look at verse 6, 1 John 2, verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Um, and the idea is that we walk just like Jesus walked. This is how we're to live our lives. Well, what happens if I don't? Well, it, it's again, you have that which is priceless, and you're not taking full advantage of it. You're not living the way you should. You're not living, uh, taking advantage of all the opportunities to be rewarded in your life. You're not impacting people the way you should be. Because remember, people watch your lives. Children watch your lives. Your neighbors watch your lives. Your coworkers watch your lives. Your extended family, everyone's always watching. And that shouldn't be something that's bad because if you mess up, you could say, look, forgive me. That's not how the world operates. When people mess up and they go to one another and they say, listen, forgive me, I think I've sinned, that makes a great impact upon people. I gotta just tell you, having assurance of salvation is so critical. And so these two tests of keeping God's commandments and walking like Jesus are gonna help you. You have something more important than a priceless piece of work that you can buy at a garage sale for five dollars. You have something that even if you spent millions of dollars that is more important than that. You have a born again soul and live accordingly, live differently. If you are God, your soul is secure. And if you're living as a believer, you're assured that your salvation is genuine. You're not, you're not dealing with something that is worthless when you're talking about your soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Nobody would ever make the exchange of a priceless painting on earth for their priceless soul because even their priceless soul is more valuable than a priceless piece of art because your soul goes on forever. This world is passing away and also it's lust. This world is going to be burned up. The priceless artwork is going to be burned up. But what happens if you're not passing these tests? Well, get saved. Come to faith. Repent. Go in a new direction. Cry out to God. I need to know that I'm so saved. I pray, God, that you will hear my cry. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember, we've talked about this with the ABCs of salvation. Admit your sinner. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God and man who died on the cross and rose again. But call upon his name because whoever calls upon his name will not be disappointed. God wants you to have knowledge. And so assurance is important. Work through this book, because remember, 1 John is a book about giving assurance. See me. I remember I did my dissertation on this, and I've got a catechism, a questionnaire, basically, that can help you if you're doubting your salvation. But then if you don't get assurance through all of that, get saved, because you only have one life. And as I emphasized last week, you only have one shot at it. There is no second chance. There is no purgatory. Believe today believe because your soul is priceless. Know that it's genuinely born again. Amen.